Hi everyone, it's Dave Levine here. Thanks ever so much for joining me for episode number 46 of the Sports Stories podcast. This is the podcast where we delve and dive deep into the lives and the sports stories of those individuals who have had a successful career either in sport or through sport. Now, last week's guest was Christoph Ridley. Christoph shared how he has driven and grown through his career from a performance sports person right the way through to being a professional rugby union referee. Christoph really shared many vulnerabilities about what it's like to be a referee, how he's perceived, how he gets gratification, and how he actually builds his self-confidence and his self-worth. Now, today, we move on to our special guest, who is Daniel Brown, MBE. Daniel is also a professional sports person, or was a professional sports person, should I say. Daniel was a double Olympic gold medalist in para-archery. Daniel's also got a great story how she's transitioned into the business world and become a really successful business person. I'm really looking forward to hearing how Danielle has overcome adversity and really succeeded, built her confidence, her self-worth, and is developed to create such a lovely story. And he's even put in pen to paper now and has become an author sharing many books. Now, I'm really confident, Daniel, as many of my previous guests, will offer many great pearls of wisdom, some gems of learning, and will offer you many takeaways, tips, guidance, and things that you can use really practically in your life. So grab a pen, sit back, get a cup of tea, go out on your bike, do your run, do whatever you do to really maximize the time and invest in yourself when listening to her story. Please continue to give feedback, give your comments, subscribe, tell your friends about the the podcast because as always we're really looking to share and encourage more people to engage with the content and really benefit from the stories of our great guests all it now leaves me to do is wish a very warm welcome to my very special guest double olympic gold medalist daniel brown mbe daniel thank you ever so much for giving up your valuable time and joining me on the uh, sports stories podcast it's uh, fantastic to have you with me and i'm really excited to find out a little bit more about your journey what you've been up to but just before we get cracking um i'm conscious you've been so busy how are you and how how's things going at the moment for you oh i'm great yeah it's i mean i think it's sort of um a a really weird and wonderful time for so many people isn't it um coming out of lockdown three but yeah I'm I'm doing well I'm I'm staying positive I'm keeping busy which is uh, always good fun yeah oh brilliant well look you know I'm not sure where we're going to go here because you know a, a two-time Paralympic gold medalist inclusion champion speaker author I'm sure you've got so many more of the titles um can you give us a clue about how you started on the journey towards all of those lovely titles yeah, and I, I think that's a really nice place to start, actually, because I I think really when I I look into it, when when I look at both my sporting success and and I suppose wider success as well, I really have to thank my parents. I I didn't come from a place of privilege, um, or neither did I come from a place of underprivilege or, or deprivation, yeah. but I, I really did come from a place of love and support. And, you know, my parents gave me these really key messages, which were around giving maximum effort. And, you know, sort of if, if I could come away from something, whether I'd won or I'd lost, as long as I'd given it my absolute best, then they couldn't ask for any more than that. Um, so that was like one message and the other thing was like there was no such word as can't so I wasn't right. actually allowed to use that in my vocabulary <laughs> and uh, yeah no, it was really good every time I said the word can't it was you know really stamped on no doesn't exist doesn't exist so I, I think you know the, those messages really I guess sort of instilled the, the, the right mindset for success but mm-hmm. also you know my parents were into the outdoors so we okay. did lots of walking and camping and cycling so so really that was where my love for sport came from but um i i didn't get into um sort of real competitive sport till my my teens so i was 15 okay. when i started archery right um so yeah it was it was a very strange i suppose journey into it like i always loved sport but i was rubbish at them <laughs> um yeah and everything i tried i i always gave it my best but the results just weren't there and for me sport was a hobby it was never going to be a career choice and um what did you was... get what did you get from the sport then do you think at that early age if you know a lot of people say oh well i get it because i, I like to be successful and win and all of that sort of stuff but if you know if you said you were rubbish at it for instance what, what did you get 
Yeah, I, that's a really good question. I think really it was a friendship. Oh. I thought that was fantastic. The social side of it, it was a place where you could meet new new people and, and sort of enjoy that aspect. Oh. I enjoyed the whole concept of trying something new. You know, it was exciting when you got to try a different oh. sport. Um, and I love that, just giving something a go, getting out of my comfort zone. And it didn't matter if I didn't do well. Uh, and then for some of the sports that I engage with, I, I guess on more of a regular basis. So I, I did quite a bit of running. Right. Um, my, my sisters, both of them younger than me, used to beat me. But I, oh, okay. I enjoyed, yeah, it was really embarrassing. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess I enjoyed sort of, working at it and seeing if I could be a bit better next time and I suppose there was that competitive um element that even if I couldn't beat my sisters I was going to give it my all to to try so go on tell me a bit more about this competitive bit you know how would how did that play out with you I guess you just got two sisters is that right yeah that's right yeah. both younger yes yeah, yeah two sisters. And, and how how did that play out in the family and what what role did that play do you think in terms of really driving you forward towards you know your your later and greater involvement in sport yeah it's fascinating actually because um my sisters and i i suppose have all been into sport okay. so um, my little sister did archery as well and comp uh, represented great britain too which was uh, really nice doing that together yeah. Um, my middle sister's actually a um, university lecturer a phd in sports psychology so sport has <laughs> You know, it's kind of um, played an important part in all of our lives. So and I think that that competitive side of things that I, you know, I think when you're kids, it can get a little bit nasty, but equally you spur each other on and you help each other out as well. So that was that was quite nice. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you've given a, a real good flavour of obviously sport has uh, been a massive part of, of family life at an early stage. Um, your parents obviously being supporting and loving and so on what are the roles that they play in terms of really helping you move forward and you know how did that sort of progress into the uh, you know your teenage years and when you became more involved in a more sort of um, professional way yeah so one of the big things that happened to me at that age was my disability so I, I wasn't always disabled um, at the age of 11 my feet started to hurt after I'd been running and it was just more of a minor inconvenience at the time, you know, sort of a little bit of pain after I've been running. And at the age of 13, that was where it really started to affect my mobility. And I was struggling to walk, struggling to get around school. I was uh, dependent on crutches and a wheelchair. Uh, and we still didn't have a diagnosis. I, I wasn't, um, it wasn't until I was 16 before I got a diagnosis. Wow. And we, we had to go to Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. So it was my, my, my very first trip to London. Yeah. So it was a very difficult time, you know, partly because the doctors didn't know what was wrong. But again, my parents were very supportive throughout the whole uh, time. They're always looking to try and find a way to, to help me, to, to hopefully find a cure. We, we eventually learned uh, when I got my diagnosis at 16, um, I've got complex regional pain syndrome. Right. Uh, we learned that there is no cure and and that was it so um yeah it was it, it was a very very tough time in those teenage years but um one of the things I really struggled with was not being able to do sport or not being able to do the ones I used to and at the time I didn't know much about Paralympic sport it wasn't as yeah. um widely promoted as it is now yeah so um, I figured really I was down to either archery or swimming uh, and I thought that playing with bows and arrows just seemed a bit more fun than popping up and down a ball so yeah so that's kind of the the, the journey into um, into sort of Paralympic sports I guess now if if we take you back to to that time though when you were you know pre-diagnosis can you recall what that was like for you and how did you manage yourself during that really uncertain time where you know, obviously your mobility was really getting quite badly affected with no real sense of what was going on. How was that in your teenage years? It was tough. I mean, I think teenage years are tough, tough for yeah. any teenage. You know, it's a time where you, you're actually gaining that independence away yeah. from, from your parents. That you, you're figuring out who you are and what you want to do with the rest of your life. Mm. So, so, you know, that, that's a challenging time for anybody. And for me, with this condition... 
uh, it completely fractured my self-esteem you know right. I, I didn't know who I was I didn't know well, I knew what I wanted to do and I wanted to be successful I had these big aspirations um I, I couldn't quite decide what my career was going to look like I flitted between a vet a lawyer uh also you know all these different ideas but I did have big dreams and I did want to make a success of life and I think because disability uh was and, and still is you know it, it is underrepresented it is misrepresented um I I really struggled with that and I worried I, I lived in fear you know I had these big aspirations trying to push me forward and these hang-ups uh, about my disability trying to hold me back because I, I worried that other people wouldn't be able to see past the crutches past the wheelchair right. and actually see the value that lay within mm. and yeah I, I, I really did find that tough as a teenager. And Daniel how did you manage yourself through that what sort of support mechanisms or you know as you say for teenage people it's really tricky anyway you know but then you had the the additional challenges that you faced you know what strategies did you call on or you know how did you manage that yeah I think um of, of, again family were absolutely right. crucial you know and and what was really good with them was they didn't let me take an easy way out okay. you know yeah they didn't sort of oh you, you're really struggling you know it was no you keep going and whilst at the time sometimes you could think oh this is really really cruel actually looking back it has really really helped me in terms of set my mindset and know what my limits are okay. and I suppose it's that whole thing about not quitting um you know I keep going and keep going and keep going till, till I achieve and I really really am grateful for for that support right. Um, but for me, really, what what helped was sport, you know, getting involved in archery. I, I took it up on my 15th birthday. I hadn't got my diagnosis yet, right. but it was just something that I figured I could do. Uh, and my dad and I did a beginner's course at the local club. I was absolutely rubbish at it again, yeah. you know, <laughs> like all the other sports. But, um, you know, I was back outside. I was back doing sport. And it was just the sort of, I suppose, most freeing, uh, amazing thing. And I think what I quite liked about archery was I wasn't part of a, a disability sports club. Not that there's anything wrong with disability sports clubs, but I just wanted to be a person. I, I wanted an outlet where I could go and play sport with everybody else. Mm. And that was what uh, archery gave me. You've made me reflect and you use these words, you know, your kind of your mindset and, and also what's come through what you just shared there about is your determination. And I'm curious to know about, you know, how were you set up before you started, you know, um, feeling your condition uh, and then being diagnosed or has your mindset and determination really shone through as a result of that? No, I think those messages that, you know, the ones that I mentioned right at the beginning that yeah. my parents gave me, particularly yeah. that um, not being allowed to use the word can't. Right, yeah. You know, every time I said the word can't, it was no such thing as can't. There's always a way. Yeah. Um, and, and I really do think that that helped because when it came to the disability, if you'd say, I can't do that, it's you, you've got, it's just yeah. so, I suppose, second nature. I, even now, you know, I'm in my 30s and I still say that to myself. There's no yeah. such thing as can't. It's can't. always about looking for those solutions. Yeah. So I absolutely do think that um, those messages really, really helped. But I do think that when you go through those kind of situations, you you know, you either sink or you swim. And I, I like to say that even in adversity, you always have a choice. You know, yeah. you can give up or you can get up. Uh, and for me, you know, it really, it's about getting up and it's about taking one step forward at a time, trying to figure out what what to do with with the challenge. And, and I think through that you learn. And now, like looking back, I, I know that it doesn't matter what challenge I'm thrown. I've been through that, and that that was a a real big challenge to get through. So so actually, it makes it easier to get through future challenges, if that makes sense. Yeah, maybe make, well, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and you, you've given me the thought there, though, around, you know, you, you've said a couple of times how rubbish you were at sport. And, you know, clearly done very well in, in sport. So you 
so you know is is your sporting achievements and ability how much of it was physical and also then how much of it was just kind of mental because clearly you you must have been you know reasonably talented physically as well yeah no that's a really great question i i would say that for me the mental side pretty much runs through everything even the physical yeah. aspect right. you know yeah. I think that I suppose that motivation to train and actually put the effort in that that's all mental. So, so for me, um, that the mental side runs a hundred percent through and alongside everything else. When when I first started, you know, honestly, it was a miracle if I could hit the target. Really, was it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. It was. Um, so you know, I'm I'm not sort of being uh, self depreciating or anything. Uh, it, it, I, I wasn't great at it but I enjoyed it and I think why or how I ended up getting better was firstly I found an out and you know archery became a hobby it became a way for me to deal with my pain so every day as soon as I got back from school I'd be pestering my mom and dad to take me to practice right. so, so I did practice a lot right well, and you just said a, a way of managing your pain so d- doing the activity did it actually and this might sound a bit strange, did it actually uh, alleviate some of the pain or or was it kind of a distraction from the pain? Yeah, distraction for sure. Right. So right. yeah, when I'm doing it, I'm still in pain, it's still there, right. but it's it's removed. And then when you're in competition as well, when you get that adrenaline rush, um, that pain becomes even more removed. It, again, it's that real powerful mind-body kind of connection there. Does that resonate? Yeah, yeah, I think, um, oh, I, I do think for me, the, the, the mind is, is so important. And I, I think that if you get that bit right, everything else will follow, particularly when it comes to sort of your physical limits, you know, that there's so much, or, or that, that, that they're so further along than sometimes you, you believe in yourself. And I think really testing that and pushing yourself, um, that it's the only way to learn, really. So how, how did you progress through the world of kind of archery? So, you, you know, you, you, from, from not being able to hit the target or not being very good um, at the age of kind of 15, 16 ish. How did you how did you go on from there? And, and what did, what difference did that make to your life? Yeah, so I did. Um, for me, it was a very quick progression, obviously, going from being not very good at all um, to making the Great Britain team in three years. Right. What made a difference was actually um, the type of bow I shot. So I I started with a training bow, wooden training bow, which was uh, really difficult. Yeah. I moved on to what's called a compound bow, which um, is is quite neat. It's a lot shorter. It's, yeah. it's faster. It's more powerful. Uh, yeah. We do have the magnified um, lens. So that is much more of a mental game than a physical. But I found that my balance is absolutely rubbish um okay. i found that that helped yeah uh, and also a bit later down the line when i started to sit down to shoot rather than standing okay. up you know i that sort of then saw another big leap in my scores as well yeah so yeah it was a very very quick progression um but it was really down to my local club to start with i had two coaches there that saw my potential I quite frankly, when I look back, I don't know what they saw because I couldn't see it. Um, you know, <laughs> what, what did you show then? Do you think? I don't know. I don't know. But they kept telling me this. They kept saying, "Oh, you've got potential. You've got potential." And because they believed it, I suppose I started to believe it too. And you know, I just kept wanting to keep pushing forwards till I reached this potential that they saw in me. So I suppose, in a way, like I didn't put any limits on what I could achieve because you know they, they were there saying that I could achieve amazing things in the sport so yeah I just kept going out there with I guess quite an open mind expecting to do well and then when I did do well it just reaffirmed that whole thing that oh I've got potential uh, and so I just keep getting better and better and better. Hmm. But Daniel you make it sound so simple that you know if I just believe that actually if I keep going out there and doing my best and it just be cyclical, I'll get better. And it, and it, it kind of grew. Was there anything more to that? Cause I'm really conscious again, you know, we touched on the psychology, you know, I, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have worked in, in, um, in some Paralympic sports and in para archery for a short period of time. So I do have a good understanding 
or an understanding of your environment. And for me, you're playing it down somewhat. And I'm just thinking, wow, you know, what strategies did you use? Because it's a, a fine motor movement kind of activity here and how you really have to hold your body and the, the accuracy that's required mm -hmm. and so on. And I'm just wondering, gosh, are there any other sort of tools or strategies that you could share that you maybe called on that might help some of our listeners even in what they do? Yeah, it was it was really interesting, actually. I think um, listening to coaches helped. Right. You know, um, they, I, as I said, I had fantastic coaches, and they they were really really um, beneficial both to me as an individual. You know, as a teenage girl having yeah. two adults, it was a, a married couple, and you know having these guys to bounce ideas off help me I suppose mature as a person which right, which okay. is fantastic um and you could go to them for advice sporting and otherwise yeah. but um also having uh, you know that their feedback and and their support in terms of getting my equipment right and and getting my technique right uh, and again that comp competitive element you know that they, they will keep pushing me and pushing me and I wanted to sort of, I suppose, tap into that. Um, so for me, I suppose it happened quite organically, even though yeah. it did happen very quickly. What I found though was working on my strengths. Okay. So all the way through my archery career, I suppose, um, you know, people kept telling me my technique was rubbish. Right. And I've been <laughs> told that my entire career that my technique was rubbish. Mm -hmm. Uh, it worked for me yeah, it you worked. Know? And <laughs> yeah. exactly it worked and so it didn't matter what other people told me but I found my strength really was the mental side and it was about dealing with pressure right and and again that was something that I thought was quite natural to start with that seemed to be my forte but actually when I invested a lot of time and effort and energy into sort of trying to get better at it you know I, I found that that was the thing that really set the people that go out and win and those that don't apart so yeah I would a hundred percent advise people to um to sort of really invest in that that self-development you know working on you as a person um as well as you as an athlete but really sort of focusing on that uh, you know for me it was the pressure side because you can shoot thousands and thousands of arrows in practice but it doesn't matter if you can't put a good few together in competition and and how you manage yourself in that pressure situation i guess yeah. is is key yeah yeah other than just the kind of the the um the psychological aspect and the the mental side of the sport what what other learnings have you taken from your career in the sport that you could uh, have been kind of transferable and you've taken with you out of it so much i've literally copied and pasted um what i use in sport i think right success is success and it doesn't matter what field you're in you can you can learn and I think really sport has been one of my greatest teachers you know I think right. it's taught me it's taught me about myself yeah. um you know what I'm like as a person and giving me really really awesome self-awareness levels I've learned about all the things that I'm good at, you know, where my strengths are, where and the areas of challenge, you know, the areas that I do need to improve on. I learned that I'm good under pressure. I learned that um, how to set goals, how to turn like this huge, huge dream into a reality by breaking it down into smaller, more manageable steps. And, you know, I sort of, I suppose, developed my own goal setting model around that okay. um, in order to, to achieve. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've found that sport in so many ways, you know, that the communication, the leadership, the, um, the teamwork, you know, all of these are really, really transferable. And I've just, as I said, copied and pasted so much from from sport to education. You know, I, I noticed that as I was um, doing better in sport, I was performing better in things like exams right. um, wow. and then in business as well. So, yeah, I just just copy paste. I, I, and I'm going to be a little bit unfair here, but if you were to say, you know, what are the two or three nuggets which you would say are, are sort of the non-negotiables to, to cut and paste across from your learnings in a performance sport environment to other environments, what might they be? confidence so about believing in yourself and your ability yeah 
So absolutely, um, I invest a lot of time into that. So right. I'd say that's important. Resilience, um, you know, we're always going to face setbacks, challenges, doesn't matter what it is. And I, it really is who can recover quickest, I, right, I think, okay. really important. And then the third one would be goal setting, you know, really how you, um, you know, that, that, that strategy behind it, how you, you actually manage to look at, I suppose, who you are, why, why are you doing what you're doing, where you want to go, what you want to achieve uh, and how you're actually going to get there. And I think once you can sort of answer those questions, um, I think that 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 sort of ends up taking you uh, on that path forwards. Hmm. And if I pick you up on the, the confidence and the resilience kind of approaches, um, how have you built them? Um, you know, because I'm, I'm conscious again of, you know, people listening in thinking, you know, wow, those are easy words to throw out there. But I'm just, you know, I, and I appreciate we don't all build and develop ourselves in the same way. Um, but I'm just wondering again, you know, what, what helped you build your confidence and what helped you build your resilience? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. And that's actually something that I I completely agree with with everything you're saying, because that was that was my big issue. Right. I I realized I needed to be more confident. Actually, it was uh, the Beijing Paralympics. I had a, a bit of a mental meltdown the night before. Okay. Um, not the most ideal place to have it. <laughs> um, but, but creating, yeah, pre cre creating pressure for yourself hey <laughs> I did I did it was pretty much like everything was going really well I was uh, made it through to the semi-finals so it was literally two medals away from that gold medal and it just started with one thought you know one what if and before I knew I'd spiraled out of control and genuinely wow. believed I couldn't do it and I you know I was very lucky I received um an email from my equipment man who he told me I could shoot scores in my sleep that my competitors could only ever dream of and yeah wow. even though that makes no no sense whatsoever the fact somebody else believed in me that that kind of I suppose stuck that sticking plaster okay on the issue and next day I was I was up off and, and I won but I just realized how important that was and you know if you left it to chance next time I might not be able to do that but, but you, you are right, you know, when I, I was in that moment, I realized that my whole life people told me I needed to be more confident. Uh, and as I sort of mentioned before, this is something that really got affected with my, my disability as well. Yeah. But um, nobody told me how, you know, everyone kept telling me I needed to be more confident. Yeah, what does nobody, that mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Nobody showed me what I needed to do. Nobody showed me that there were strategies to become more confident. They just sort of said it. And it was as if by telling me to be more confident, I'd yeah. somehow miraculously develop it. And of yeah. course I didn't. Yeah. So, so for me, really, it was all about redefining my definition of success. And I okay. think, yeah, I, I think with, if you look at success in general, I think in many ways we're pressured into what success is, you know, I was having a, actually having this conversation yesterday <laughs> about how you know people seem to think you know, sort of various brands and associating them with success and what you own and your possessions and actually you know sort of people sometimes see that as success and uh, for you know for me like redefining my my definition of su success that does not feature into it ab absolutely at all um now whereas you know when I was younger things like that might have done but um, it was also about focusing on the tiny wins, tiny successes, rather than, I suppose, the big gold medal winning achievements. And if I could show that I was making progress, even if it hadn't gone perfectly or I wasn't quite where I wanted to be, you know, that was still a success. So it was about really honing in on those positives. And I found the more I did that, the more I actually recognised um, accepted and appreciated all my strengths and my achievements that really helped me to build my confidence on that flavor then daniel the idea of you know defining success and if we were to fast forward a little bit from you know from your your paralympic days um and to the kind of the here and now how would you define what your success is now you know wh where are you going and what what are you kind of doing now yeah, uh, for me, I, it's, it's all about purpose and it's about, you know, a meaningful purpose. So I 
I got to where I did in sport because people helped me um so many people helped me so many people gave me chances gave me opportunities uh, and without them I you know I can't say for certain whether I I would or wouldn't have been there but it certainly would have been a lot more difficult so for me now being able to help people and being in that position to actually make a difference for me is you know where I see my success is and sure you know that there are obviously the material successes like um every time I I sort of get a publishing deal you know I'm I I love that I, I've I've wanted to be an author since I was four years old really so okay. you know that's a really cool um measurable achievement but equally it really is all about that helping people making a difference there and you make such a lovely distinction between the idea of actually you know getting a publishing deal but actually it's not about it's not solely about the deal is it it's about what the deal brings in terms of helping people and making a difference to other people's lives through through the the book or through the, the thing that you've authored you know and yeah, i think it's exactly. the, the fallout yeah exactly and i do you know i meet so many people like aspiring authors and and it's wonderful you know I always try and help where I can and I you know they, they'll say to me you know I I just want one person to read it you know if it makes a difference to one person's life then I'll be happy and I completely agree with them you know I think that, that that's wonderful but in order to reach that one person you've actually got it got to get it into people's hands don't you and and sort of get it out there so you know there's it, it, it's one of those things that you've got so many different avenues to go down and so, so many uh, I suppose different parts of that goal all falling in um at the same the, the, the same thing mm. I, I, and I, I, if, if I'm being quite um uh pointed here you know the, the idea of helping people really resonates with me as well um but I guess I ask myself that question you know it, it's it's a big throwaway term and I'm just wondering you know do you do you have it even more defined so you, you talked a little bit about the achievements and the the more sort of uh, granular or tiny steps who, who more specifically are you looking to try and help and make a difference with and 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 how are you currently doing that yeah it's a, a great point um i i think that um for, for me like when you look at motivations and motivating factors for yeah. sure i i actually find that i've i've sort of i'm motivated by things like i know we've already spoken about competition yeah. and we've uh, you know i'm definitely motivated by performance and results but um equally that that helping side of of things and i think when that you bring all those elements together it, it is or it becomes slightly easier to define because you've got different competing interests. Um, but but it, yeah, it, ma it makes it easier to, to outline. But essentially, I I want to help people break down barriers, um, unlock their potential, and achieve more. Uh, and specifically, I'm I'm very keen on on helping other girls, uh, women, because mm -hmm. I you know that the barriers there are, are quite specific, mm. uh, and we have you know. I, I always think it's important to look at the positives. I do think we have made a lot of headway. Mm -hmm. uh, and I like to, in sport, we always talk about medal potential, don't we? Medal potential mm -hmm. world class. <laughs> and I think that's exactly where we are when it comes to sort of, um, you, know, you know, the gender side of things. Women are currently medal potential. Yeah. And that's where we are we, with equality. We, we've made all the big changes. Now it's just sort of the, the smaller things that that need working on to, to actually get to that that world class level mm -hmm. so so yeah i really like working with um i do a lot in the corporate sector with women uh professional women but i have noticed that so many of the the stereotypes the barriers that the, the invisible um limitations stem from childhood right. so yeah i'm so I'm really keen and i love i love working in schools because i just think you can have such an impact in terms of passing on those really positive messages mm -hmm. that you know it might not realize it at the time but if it just gets somebody to think a little bit differently or set those aspirations and believe that actually i can do that there's nothing stopping me doing that mm -hmm. i think that's um that's really important um, so yeah, I do I do a lot around that. I do a lot around disability as well. I think disability, uh, again, as I, I mentioned, is you know quite often underrepresented, misrepresented. So so being able to work in that field, um, yeah, for me is really really important. You've clearly got your hands busy at the moment, aren't you? Working in these different areas, and I I, I just really love again the idea though of 
looking at root cause and I guess going back to childhood and seeing the the, uh, the impact we can make there or that you're making really resonates with me and uh, uh, the, the, the principle of kind of nearly a, um, a talent pathway nearly you know bringing sport to just into life principles of actually if we make a difference with some four or five year olds now we might only reap and really see the benefits in the corporate world in maybe 20 years time but you've got mm. to sort of lay the foundations absolutely i yeah i love it actually talent mm. pathway i think that that pretty that sums it up really well you, you touched on a point there about you know you helping other people because you've been helped by so many people along your way and and i it resonated with me the idea though around um the transformation or the the transition i guess from athlete to helper so that kind of principle of being selfless when you're having to really work for yourself and be quite an, an individual and now you've kind of flipped and are helping others and being more selfless um how, how have you managed that kind of idea because it gets talked around a lot in the sport performance world yeah um that's a really good point because i i do think as an athlete um you know i was selfish and i i actually remember my, my mum um actually when, when i started to get quite good at sport my mum sort of gave me some well she gave me a choice she said you know you can either continue your archery and we'll support you all the way but yeah. you've got to be in a hundred percent you've got to be selfish you've got to put it first because if you want to go out with your friends and you want to spend time with them and you just want a normal teenage life that's absolutely fine too you know but you, you make your choice and you don't just sort of um, choose archery and then drop out two months down the line because it's not for you. you you make that choice now and I think in some ways you know it, it was really really important message but I suppose with that yes the sport absolutely came first um I remember 2012 I think I saw my family maybe three or four times before going to the games because I was just training all the time and and that was the important bit uh, and I you know and it sounds awful it's a bit of a <laughs> they have a bittersweet uh compliment or backhanded compliment isn't it uh, you know yeah. my family say I'm a much nicer person now <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah I I think sort of getting getting out of that environment I think helped you know I think um I, you know and I, I will be honest it was a toxic environment at the right. at the national center I think uh, called it Azkaban it, 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 was, <laughs> it was very very toxic and I don't think being in that environment helps a right? helps your mental health but either I don't think it helps your attitude mm. um so you know I think I was caught up in that I um so I think removing that environment and it was amazing when I set up my own business straight out of sport I expected the business world to be just like the sport world right. And I got like the biggest shock when people were helping me yeah. and they expected absolutely nothing in return, you know, and I started learning about these things like called synergy and networking <laughs> and alignment collaboration. And collaboration. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Right. And it was just, a, it was just sort of a real, I suppose, like eye opener because I didn't realize these existed um, because that wasn't my experience in sport. And you know again I don't know if that's because I obviously did an individual sport so whether that's sort of very different from a, a team sport I don't know but um yeah it was just it was just amazing and I was like in this business world I was like I really like this you know, and I, I guess because I liked it and, and people were helping me and I I can never say this word is it re reciprocity reciprocity <laughs> one reciprocity I uh, know I can't do it. I can't say that word uh, but but you know what I mean? It, yeah. it was all about that. You know, you, you get, but you also give. And the yeah. more you give, the more you get. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So it was just a really, really cool um, environment that I think shaped me and, yeah. and, and helped me. And it was about taking, I suppose, that yeah. really hard performance angle, but I suppose softening around the edges to better engage with people. Yeah. And you really played to me the idea again of taking the positives out of what you've experienced there and utilizing it or you know what all learning is positive isn't it if you use it accordingly and appropriately yeah yeah, yeah absolutely i think if you um even if things go horribly wrong yeah. you know you're in a better situation because you know what doesn't work yeah. um so yeah it is absolutely about learning 
Great stuff. So um, I'm going to now point you in the direction of, you know, the, the people that you, who have helped you. How, have, how did these people really help you? And, you know, who, who's really influenced you and impacted on you uh, in a positive way and how? Oh, super question. So I think the first, um, obviously, I have to be parents, you know, they they shape so much of my upbringing and, you know, they've always supported me, continue to support me. Right. Um, you know, they're, they're always there. And I, I think that having that um, help support, uh, having that belief in me as well, yeah. I think has been really important. Uh, the two coaches that I mentioned at the club, again, really helped shape my my early um, career. You know, they, they were fantastic in terms of, of that. I suppose they were sort of second parents in a way, as well yeah. as coaches, Yeah. Um, which, which was fantastic later in sport I did have a brilliant coach Kim Lucas he was um he was amazing he he wasn't a national coach he was level two coach right, but right. he he worked really well with me and I think that's the important thing you know that mm. relationship being able to to sort of trust somebody to to work with them uh, Kim knew if I was having a good or a bad day just by looking at me he didn't need right. to ask and, and he knew exactly what I needed in order to keep me going or you know turn things around so um that that was helpful I, I learned so much from him and then you know if we move on from sport I met um I met a wonderful wonderful guy um I, I still work with him Hardeep Rai um we met completely randomly <laughs> I just I suppose I, I, I was I was meeting somebody else um I was having a meeting with somebody else and he was hosting the meeting and he was very very passionate about disability because his son was born with a disability okay. and um he decided to set up an investment firm investing in disabled entrepreneurs wow and yeah it was really really great and I just literally started my business and Hardeep said you know do you want to do you want to be involved in this uh, and I said yes and at what amazed me at that time, you know, I'd, I'd just gone from sport to business. There was so many unknowns. I, I hadn't a clue about business or starting right. one. And he just took a chance on me. He took... He, he Believed said, in you again. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, you know, I'm still involved with Kaleidoscope. We've, we've grown from an investment firm into a recruitment firm, an advisory firm. We've got a foundation. And it's just a wonderful organisation to be part of uh, with a really nice ethos behind it. It's all yeah. about that making a difference and helping people. But um, yeah, just the fact that he he saw something in me again or, you know, whether he did or didn't. Um, but he, he just said, do you want to do this? And mm. uh, yeah, I'd, I'd never done it before, but I've learned so much from him. Um, and yeah, been going for six years now. So it's very exciting. And, and I, what's just struck me again is uh, when he asked you the question, do you want to do this? And, you know, there is only one response which you've been brought to believe, which is, you know, you can't use the word I can't do this. So yeah. there's only one response really, isn't there, in terms of I can do it. Yeah, let's go. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> very positive yeah. again. <laughs> Yeah, I was saying yes to opportunities, I think, uh, I think is important. Yeah, and there's a real message there that really is sort of dripping out from our conversation is that there's always, it's always positive, it's always yes, it's a can-do attitude, you know, let's give it a go and give it our best and, you know, yeah. amazing, amazing stuff. Uh, Daniel, I just wanted to focus in a little bit, again, in terms of, you know, you've, you've been so brilliant in explaining how you wish to help other people and support their development and you've also touched on the fact uh, of writing a number of books and keen on being an author so I just want to turn the table a little bit and say you know what books have really helped you along the way and could you uh, share any sort of um, tips or signposts to any books which might be really beneficial to some of our listeners that have helped you yeah that's a really good good uh, question um so i i found one of the the biggest ones um was and death came third i don't know if you you, you come across that yeah i've come across it but none of my previous guests on the podcast have ever mentioned it so that's fabulous cool 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 <laughs> now i love it i love it so i do quite a bit of public speaking and i i love doing public speaking um it's actually very similar to sport you know and competing you you're out there you can't hide you've got to be perfect you've got to deliver 
And um, yeah, reading that book was just really cool, sort of understanding about human fear. And, um, you know, sort of was it number one fear is public speaking. Number, number two fear is walking into a room full of strangers. Right. Uh, and death came third, which, you know, when you think about it, put it into perspective, is completely ridiculous. Yeah. So, yeah, I just, for me, it was quite an eye opener. I, I find um, human, human beings, people, it's so fascinating. Uh, and I suppose it comes back to what we were talking about before, all about that mindset and just making sort of small shifts and tweaks to your mindset and the way you think can just have such an incredibly powerful and big impact on your, your behavior, on your performance. So, yeah, I'd, uh, I, I would recommend that. Any other such because it was such a great book. Have you got any other other little tips or tell us a little bit about the books that you've written and and the impact that they uh, that you would ideally like them to have? Yeah. So, well, my first book that I wrote was actually I, I wrote it with a seven year old boy, Nathan Nathan Kai, um, and he's a remarkable uh, young man. He I, I met him speaking at a Mensa event, and he came up to me and said have you written a book for children about how they can be the best they can be? And I said, no, but that's a really good idea. And he's like, well, I've been looking, I've looked everywhere and I can't find one. Do you think we could write one together? Perfect. I know, I know. And, and again, it comes back to, I suppose, that whole concept that we were talking about, about saying yes to opportunities. Yeah. Well, Nathan wanted an opportunity, but there, was, that there wasn't one to say yes to. So he created his own. And I was just so amazed by that and and that foresight at the age of seven that you know he, he really wanted to be the best he could be but there, there wasn't that help or support for him and you know and, and he is right there's so much out there for adults but but not for children so we wrote the book together um, be your best self which came out uh, 2019 um but yeah i've been writing other things for me um role models people I think are very very important um you know you see it you can uh, you can be it that kind of thing so the next one I've got coming out on the 7th of July is uh, is run like a girl which features 50 female athletes and continuing to be that sort of inspiration and role model it seems to be a real thread through this um and and I also like that coming back to those words we shared earlier on around sort of alignment and collaboration is doing things with people um, but also really living true to your beliefs and making a difference and aligning to those values, which um, really comes out strong in what you've said. So um, congratulations on those. And I, I look forward to seeing and hearing more of them. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you. A, a couple more questions then, just to finish us off. And um, this is always one I, I, I'm curious about and, and like to ask. And you've touched on parts of it, but, you know, you've been on an amazing journey and shared some of your your learnings but if you were to start again you know what kind of tips or what guidance would you give to a, a younger teenage version of yourself given what you know now um so i think you know it's all about you as a person so i think investing and innovating in yourself i'd say is absolutely critical yeah um you know sort of it, it really working on those I know they get called soft skills don't they but really they are critical skills yeah. for success so really spending time um and doing that and, and I think there has to be something around believing in yourself you know not I suppose all human beings want to fit in but really it is about sort of finding yourself understanding who you are your identity your purpose your values what really matters to you so yeah I suppose that whole self-awareness piece mm. and then and then wrapping that around with becoming the most confident person you can be well summarized beautifully there and you know and again it's lovely to hear you share that because that's really the the principles of what we're trying to pull out within the sports stories podcasts and, and all of the resources around that it's just about really supporting people to find out and develop to be you know the very best versions of themselves or maximize their their skills and their strengths and their impact so it's uh, a, something I really resonate with so thanks again for sharing that and my last question Danielle would really be around you know you, you've shared your journey and um, we've only really probably sort of scooted over the surface of many things which we could sort of delve a little bit deeper into but my question would be you know whose sports story would you be keen to hear and, and if so why oh um really good question I, I I've 
been doing a lot of research um mm. i said on on various athletes recently and yeah. i know you're not supposed to have a favorite but for me i have to say the story of um yusra mardini i you know i would love to sort of ask her questions and uh, and really just purely because of the determination um she had to to achieve her goal of, of going to the olympics and what she went through to get there was was just incredible and I, I you know I think people in a lot more comfortable positions drop off um way before she did you know it was, it was just an incredible story and I, I yeah speaking of books I would completely advise you read um her autobiography butterfly because that is just such uh, an amazing story I I think I got got through it in a couple of nights it was um Brilliant. wonderful to read Gosh, well, there's a lovely challenge, but again, you, you've whetted the appetite in terms of actually delving into people's stories and their lives and the, the gems we can learn from and the curiosity in terms of how that helps us find out about ourselves, but also learn from others. So it's a, um, a nice challenge there. So thank you for that. Uh, and look, you've shared so much about your, your journey so far in, in both in terms of uh, wanting to really help others, uh, but also be quite open and honest and vulnerable about the journey you've been on. Um, should people be interested to find out more about the, the books that are coming down the line or more of the work that you hope to do and the difference you make? Um, how might they be able to contact you or, or sort of keep in touch with you? Oh, yeah, of course. So, I mean, my website has most the information about me. So daniellebrown.co.uk. And I am pretty active on social media. So Twitter, um, Instagram and LinkedIn. Brilliant. Well, Danielle, thanks ever so much for, for giving up your time. I know that you're, you're in the middle of writing books and, and being very busy as you always are and striving to make a difference in the various domains and, and the inclusion work that you're doing. So just want to wish you really great luck on, on moving those things forward and, and please keep in touch with, with us at Sports Stories and the work that we're doing because we would love to champion and be part of some of your work as well. So thanks ever so much for being a, a great guest and sharing everything and good luck. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Take care and we'll see you soon. Well, what an enjoyable conversation that was with Danielle. And what a story she's led so far. I really love the positivity that came through in terms of how she's navigated the adversity she's faced in such a, an amazing way and actually driven that right through to being so successful in many walks of her life. She was a, it was a truly inspirational story. And I only hope that you took away as many tips and guidance and messages that sort of dripped through from the conversation as I did. Things that really stuck out for me was, yes, truly her positivity and the way that she just said yes to so many opportunities. She was really keen to make such a massive difference in everything that she did, but making that transition from being quite sort of selfless as an athlete and needing to have that quality to really drive herself forward, right the way through to now being so giving and wanting to make a difference in the world through her authoring, but also in the way that she offers speeches and helps other people. It's an amazing combination that she's shared there and such a great balance. I really like the way she drilled down and used the principles that she learned in sport. For instance, making really small, tiny successes and measuring them and making sure that they really helped motivate her to move forward. Also, managing the, the, uh, the relationships that she had around her, maximizing them, recognizing the help that she gained from both the parents, the two coaches, and other really key people that have helped her be successful in her career and recognizing that actually her self-awareness and her understanding of herself was absolutely key to who she is and what she does and how she now helps other people. And lastly, the thing I really liked was the idea that she cut and paste a lot of the key principles and the learnings and her behaviors that she gathered together and built and learned and developed as a sports person right the way through to now really using them in everyday life and is a, a successful business person as well. So it's a really lovely concept about the transferability of the skills that she's developed. So that leads me on to just posing a couple of questions as I usually do towards you. Daniela was really great in um, offering questions throughout her conversation. And one of the questions that really resonated, which she often ponders and asks herself was these, who really are you? Why are you doing what you're doing? Where do you want to go and what do you want to achieve? And how are you gonna get there and by when? So these are really big, broad questions, but she basically said those were the fundamental questions that she considers and pondered over 
coming out as being an athlete, but also they really helped her focus and give a real attention and purpose to who she was and what she did. The second question I'd like to pose, how are you going to build your confidence and resilience? She talked about the importance of having confidence and being resilient and being able to bounce back from adversity. And these are concepts which are really key to who you are and what you do. So consider those again. How are you going to build your confidence and resilience? She shared some tips and ideas how she did that and what worked for her. Think about what they are for you. Now, moving on in terms of the resources that Sports Stories offer and provide, uh, just a quick reminder, there is the programme uh, Maximising Your Coaching and Leadership Impact. Please have a look out for that. That will really help you, give you further tips in how to build and maintain and uh, develop your confidence and resilience. Furthermore, there is the coaching and mentoring offer. I, I mention this every week, but it's really purposeful and really pertinent for me to mention that, given that many of our guests have really shone through how they've used people around them to bounce ideas off, be sounding boards, but also really guide, support, and challenge them to be the very best versions of themselves. So have a look out for the coaching and mentoring offer that's available to you. And lastly, look, there's loads of um, great feedback coming through from the guests uh, from the stories that we shared last week and the weeks before, especially from Christoph Ridley's. It's been great to hear your success story. So please keep them coming. Uh, your feedback is really valuable. It really helps in terms of guiding other people to the great content, but also helps us work out what really resonates from you, what's really good and what you really enjoy. So we can keep offering great content to help you progress in your journey. And lastly, look, please continue to listen in Thanks ever so much for joining me on the journey. Um, and I also want to give a really massive thanks to today's special guest, Danielle Brown. Danielle was such a great guest and really giving in her offering and of her story. So uh, thanks for that, Danielle. And lastly, look, I've got another great guest coming on next week. Um, it, it won't be a disappointment. I've got a rebellious coach who's worked at the very top of their game who will really give you something to think about. So for me, Dave Levine, I look forward to having you with me again on the Sports Stories podcast next week. Take care and I'll see you soon.